everyone here with us in the house and those joining us online. Um, it's always a joy to come through to the next Sabbath and just love Sabbath hours. I'm sure you know what I mean. <laughs> so um, today we're going to be looking at the sky events that are coming up and in the summer and in the fall. And uh, that's always something I enjoy. I pray you'll be blessed with it. As we look at those sky events, we'll be looking at the Creator's messages in them. Um, but before we do, let's begin with our worship time with singing praises to our Heavenly Father. Um, I like the little phrase, and in fact, my daughter got it for me on a little plaque. If the stars were made to praise him, so will I. So let's sing. <clears throat> Give thanks. song today. We're going to sing another good praise one. Thy loving kindness is better than life. Kindness is better than love. My 
All right, happy Sabbath, and uh, today we haven't done a Maseroth report for a bit, so that's what we're going to be doing today. It's, uh, the talk is called Heavenly Messages in Upcoming Sky Events, and as I mentioned before, we'll be looking at the sky events in summer, since we're just beginning. In the Northern Hemisphere, we're just beginning summer, and we'll also be looking at some of the sky events in the fall. So let's start with prayer, and then we'll get right into the wonderful things in the heavens that the Creator has for us. <clears throat> Gracious Father, we praise you and thank you for Shabbat. We thank you for your wonderful sky writing. I pray that you will send your spirit to be upon us and within us wherever we may be gathered today. May our worship be pleasing in your sight. Please wash us and make us clean in the precious blood of Yeshua HaMashiach. And Father, today may our names be found in the Lamb's Book of Life. I pray that you will lead us and guide us into truth and understanding, give us wisdom, and may we discern the messages that you have for us in the heavens, and may we read the face of your beautiful clock in the sky. And so we thank you for that and ask that blessing as we worship and study to together today, and we ask it all in Yeshua's holy name. Amen. So since it's been a while, just a quick reminder, there are five keys to understanding end-time Bible prophecy. They are the uh, prophets of all the scripture prophets on the given topic, the Torah. The Bible says to the law and to the prophets, if they speak not according to this word, there's no light in it. And so the, the law of Yahweh is one of the keys to understanding doctrine and end-time events. The sabbatical and jubilee cycle is another key. And another one is the feasts. Um, Yahweh always does his things on his holy days and no other. And finally, the fifth key and the one we're focused on today is the Maseroth, which is the tapestry of the constellations, the original constellations, and the members of the solar system, which can be seen with the naked eye. These are the ones that have biblical significance and meaning and are part of the creator's clock. And so by using all five keys when it comes to end time events and understanding um, the, the times, being good watchmen on the wall of Zion, we gain from studying all five keys, timing, order, purpose, what's happening on that given event and how to prepare for it. So that's all critically important. Today, of course, our focus will be on the Maseroth, which is Yahweh's heavenly clock. And so when we look up at the heavenly lights, there is so much more than beauty, which of course there is beauty, but all time is determined by the heavens, and that's how the Creator intended for it to be. Genesis 1.14 says, And Yah said, Let there be lights in the firmament of the heaven to divide the day from the night, and let them be for signs, that's prophetic, 
and for seasons, that's the same word translated as feasts in Leviticus 23, and for days and years. So the length of a day, the length of a year, the, um, the appointed times of the annual Sabbaths, and prophetic fulfillment times are all given from the sky clock. Very exciting. So it's so important to be tuned in to the Maseroth. We don't want to ignore it at all. It would be as um, uh, difficult to align with timing with the Creator without the clock of the heavens as it would be if none of us ever knew how to tell time by the position of the sun in the sky. We didn't have a watch and we didn't have a clock. Just think how often we'd be late or <laughs> missing, and, and missing appointments. <laughs> and uh, we don't want to miss the Creator's appointments. So as we saw, one of the purposes of the heavenly lights is for prophetic signs of the times. And so that indicates that the heavens help us to know a heads up about the fulfillment of prophecy. And so today, when we look at the sky, we are going to be looking at the purpose, one of these purposes, this purpose, the purpose for discerning prophetic signs. And in fact, do you know that going back to ancient times, they didn't call them constellations. The constellations were called heavenly signs. And that is because they are so deeply tied to Bible prophecy. Um, one of the prophetic things that the heavens tell us about is the time of judgment and the wrath of Yah, the judgment day upon the wicked. That is something that's in the heavens, and we find that in Romans 1.18. The wrath of God is being revealed from heaven. That's how it's translated in English, but heaven is actually heavens as in the elevation of the sky. The wrath of God is being revealed, in other words, from the, co the constellations and the signs in the heavens against all godlessness and wickedness of people who suppress the truth by their wickedness. You know, we really do in a, live in a day when truth is suppressed by wickedness. The leading evolutionists of the world today, the leading atheists, the ones who teach this garbage to others, all know that it is impossible that life began on earth without an intelligent mind. They all know it. Um, Richard Dawkins is a famous atheist and evolutionist and author, and he's quoted and, and uh, just revered within scholarly circles. And uh, he did an interview that I thought was very interesting with uh, Ben Stein. And in this interview, um, Ben mentioned about DNA being a language and how science has learned and, and understands that language can only come from an intelligent mind. And so Dawkins said, well, maybe we were, life on earth was started by fairies in the garden. Maybe it was started by alien beings, but I refuse to believe in God uh, the way the Christians do. And so um, that's a slight paraphrase. I don't remember exactly what he said, but it was right down that line. And the fairies part he did say, and the aliens part he did say, and so he knew that an intelligent mind is the source. How often do you hear that, though, in public schools? How do you, do you hear that in public colleges? Are they teaching that to the masses of the people when they teach evolution? No, they want everyone to believe that we came out of nothing with no mind at all. And so that is an example of the wickedness of people, as it says in Romans 1.18, who suppress the truth by their wickedness. Um, and they know better themselves. In Jacob's end-time Bible prophecies, he specifically mentioned that Genesis 49 was his uh, prophetic utterance from Yah over his 12 sons, which actually extended way beyond the lifetime of his 12 sons into the time of their tribes. And so he says in Genesis 49.1, I'm about to say prophetic things to you that will befall you in what time of earth's history? In the last days. And so the signs of the heavens directly correlate, signs being the original name of constellations, they directly correlate to the 12 tribes of Israel. And so there is one main primary constellation for each of the 12 tribes. And interestingly enough, the message and the presentation of that constellation aligns with the symbol for that given tribe. And so we do see 
the message of uh, what it takes to be among the redeemed of Israel in the heavenly signs. So one part of understanding the creator's sky speech is going to be by the placement in the heavens. We use the face of a clock and the position of the hands upon the face of the clock tells us it's the placement. So in the same way, in a clock, you would have the numbers that are stationary. You have constellations in the heavens and they are stationary. But then there are things that take place upon the faces of them, like the face of a clock. And the things that take place upon the face of them help us to understand and discern the time. Now, the hour and minute hand, if you will, are the heavenly bodies. And there are seven biblical parts of the solar system represented as one meaning of the seven branches of the menorah. The sun, Kama, as it's called, with a guttural back of the throat sound like Hanukkah. And it is a reference to the heavenly father. <laughs> you know, it's amazing. In all the years of learning about Babylonian sun worship and wanting to come out of that, I was so against the sun, you know. This is a pagan thing. We don't want anything to do with it. And then I discovered that actually paganism takes whatever was the most holy and distorts it. Have you noticed that pattern? So the sun is the symbol of the heavenly father. It is the source of light and heat. And light represents truth. Yah is the source of truth. And heat represents to be fully alive spiritually and all life comes from the father. And so you remember in Revelation when he talks to the church of Laodicea, he says, you're lukewarm. I would that you were hot or cold. Cold is lost in the world. Hot is completely on fire with the spirit of Yah. So the sun is the source of light and heat, and it represents the heavenly father. And we do see that representation was well known in biblical times because when Joseph began to have dreams, he dreamed about the, uh, the, the sheaves of wheat and that um, all the 11 sheaves bowed down to his sheaf. And in that dream, the family immediately, his father immediately understood and discerned that it meant that the 12 tribes of Israel, his, his 11 brothers would be bowing down to him, to his tribe. And then in addition to that, he had another dream. And our Bibles in English say the, 12, the 11 stars and the sun and the moon bow down to Joseph's star, if you will. But it's not really star, it's constellation. Joseph's constellation was... It was and is the mighty bull, the Reim. It's the constellation of the second coming. Now, in that presentation, in that dream, as he was sharing that with his father, if this was not a well-known symbol to understand who the sun is, who the moon is, who the 11 stars are, constellations are, bowing down to his, then, then the father would have said something like, well, I need to fast and pray about that. I can see there's something significant here, but I'm going to need to pray and discover what it is. Does he do that? He instantly knows because these are well-known symbols. He said, shall I and your mother and your 11 brothers bow down to you? And so what he was saying is that he understood that the 12, his 12 sons were represented and symbolized in the 12 constellations, the primary constellations. And in addition to that, he knew the moon was his wife in the vision and he was represented in the sun because the son is the father. Mm -hmm. Okay? So that was a long way to show you that this is old, well-known truth, that the son represents the father, but more than the father only of a family, it's the heavenly father ultimately. And so, um, of course, the devil would take that as his symbol. And that's why he took it, or tried to take it. Then we have the moon, and the moon is... Lavana in Hebrew, meaning clothed in white or those who are clothed in white. And this is a symbol of the bride of Christ. Then we have Venus and the Hebrew name is Noga, meaning the bright morning star. It's a symbol of Yeshua, who is indeed the bright morning star. And then we have Mars, excuse me, Mercury. And Mercury is Kokab or Kokub in Hebrew, which means bright and shining star. And then we have um, Mars, which is Ma'adim, which means red or blood or bloody and war. And we have Jupiter, as we call it today, 
These are the pagan names, but they're commonly understood. The Hebrew name is Sadek, and it means righteousness, he who judges in righteousness, the king of righteousness. In fact, Melchizedek, we call him Melchizedek, but it's the name of this planet. And then the Melcha at the beginning, um, it means the, the king of righteousness, king in peace. So Sadek is a part of that name. Then we have Saturn, as we call it today. And Saturn is in Hebrew, Sabbatai or Sabbate, And it means the Sabbath day planet. And the root is from Shavet, meaning rest. So these are the seven biblical parts of the solar system. When these players are involved in a sky event, it is like the hands moving on the face of the clock. Okay, so the placement, the position, and the players all help us to discern the times and the signs and the meaning that the Creator has of them. As I've shared with you many times, and I especially emphasize proving this point in my second book on the stars, um, which is on the archaeology um, and astronomy uh, archeo and archaeology. The biblical patriarchs were all astronomers. So how do you determine or interpret a sky event? You get the meaning from the star names that are participating in the event. You get the meaning from the placement of the sky event, meaning the constellation in which the event appears. And you get additional meaning from Bible verses, such as if there's something about a blood moon or falling stars, if there are Bible verses that talk about it. So today, using the old methods that were used by the biblical patriarchs, we're going to look at the summer and fall sky. Let's begin with June. Since we've just barely started June, we're only three days in. We did miss a sky event. It happened last night. But, um, and sky events that happen on the Sabbath hours are especially significant, by the way. So let's look at these things. Um, in June, we don't have any feast days other than the seventh day Sabbath, of course. And we do have our new moon, in, uh, the one in each month. So we find that in each month there is a featured constellation. And the reason for the featured constellation is that as the sun appears or visually appears to move from our point of view through the sky in the year, it is moving through what the Bible calls the tabernacle for the sun. Their line is gone throughout all the earth. Psalms 19, 1 to 4. The heavens declare the glory of God, and the firmament showeth his handiwork. And then day unto day uttereth speech, night unto night showeth knowledge. There is no speech nor language where their voice is not heard. Then it says, their line, which is the ecliptic path in modern astronomy terms, is gone out through all the earth, and their words to the end of the world, which tells you that the heavens are especially speaking in the last days. In them hath he set a tabernacle for the sun. So one of the sky events of each given month is to pay attention to what part of the constellations the sun is visually in. In the month of June, it's Taom, the bridal couple. And so the sun visually passes through what they wrongly call Gemini. It's not twins. It is the bride and groom representing the call for each of us to be prepared to be among the bride and to prepare for the marriage supper of the Lamb. Revelation 19, 7 to 9 says, Let us be glad and rejoice and give honor to him, for the marriage of the Lamb is come, and his wife hath made herself ready. Every June, with the placement of the sun in visually being in Te'am, we have the call. Are you getting ready? Do you know that you need to prepare? Get ready for the marriage supper of the Lamb. And so Te'am is the 10th primary constellation, now called Gemini, as I mentioned. And uh, it portrays Christ, the heavenly bridegroom, with his bride, who are united at the marriage supper of the Lamb. And the bride looks like the groom. That's how it came to be distorted to be twins because they look like each other. Why? Because by his grace, she now fully reflects his lovely character, as the Bible says she will do in Ezekiel 16, 14. And so this is the message of Te'am. 
Teyam, of course, is the original Hebrew name for the constellation, and you can find this name in Exodus 26, 24, where it describes the coupling or the joining of the sanctuary boards, which form the wall of the holy and most holy place. It says, they shall be coupled together, Teyam, beneath, and they shall be coupled together, Teyam again, above the head of it unto one ring. Thus shall it be for them both. They shall be for the two corners. And so the concept of coupling the boards together is very significant because after the boards have been properly coupled together, you can no longer discern a separation between them, can you? The two become one. Isn't that a beautiful picture for the marriage? And that is the picture that is given in the name of this constellation, the two who are to be one. Now, everything the couple holds is very significant. Um, the harp that is being held by the bridegroom, it's in his right hand. The right hand is the biblical symbol for strength. It is uh, at his right hand are pleasures forevermore. He stands on the right hand of the Father. It isn't a literal thing. Right hand is a symbol of great strength. We certainly wouldn't say, uh, the Bible tells us that at his right hand are pleasures forevermore. We wouldn't then assume that if you are in the new world, that if you happen to be on the left-hand side of Yeshua, there's no pleasures over there. No, <laughs> we know that right hand is like saying he owns the cattle on a thousand hills. It's a Hebrew expression. And a thousand in Hebrew is a number for total, perfect, complete, absolute, all. So you don't count a thousand hills. One, two, three, and they get to a thousand, a thousand and one. Well, those cows are not yas. Of course not. So the right hand is a symbol for strength, ability to provide this. And so because of his great strength, she is saved. And so appropriately, the harp representing praise for victory is in his right hand. Because how will we be saved? How will we be at the marriage supper of the Lamb? How will we be a part of the bride? Only because of his right hand. Isn't that the truth? Is there any one of us that could be saved of our own merits? Could we be saved of our own strength? But can we get the victory? Yes, by his right hand. So very appropriately in his strength, it is shown the harp. Um, the harp of praise for victory. And of course, he is the one worthy of praise. Also, notice that he's holding the bow. If you recall, in the, one of the earlier constellations, Keshef shows the white horse and rider of Revelation 6. Today, they call this Sagittarius, and they wrongly portray it as a centaur. It's actually a rider, and the horse would have been the white horse. He's got a crown, he's got a bow, he's shooting, forth an arrow. And so this is the archer. Yeshua is the archer. The arrow is the Elijah message and the final gospel, which are one and the same being given at the end of time to show that there is no more teaching of the gospel after the second coming. Yeshua holds the bow in quietness now in symbol to show that the arrow has been shot. Everyone that is going to be reaped has been reaped. There is no more offer of the gospel beyond this point. The, the bow is at rest. Do you see it at rest in his hands? Yeah. And so it's no longer being fired. The, the gospel is no longer going forth. And the Bible tells us that when he comes and writes his law upon our hearts, it says that he will tell no man his neighbor about Yahweh because all will know me, he says, and that's in Jeremiah. <laughs> and indeed, all will know him. <laughs> all right. So the arrow that was shot represents, as I mentioned, the everlasting gospel. Also, the message is destroying to wickedness. In Psalms 45, 5, the arrow is sharp in the heart of the king's enemies. But we recognize we don't wrestle flesh and blood, so the enemies are the kingdom of hell. The arrow is long gone, and the spear, the gospel, is finished. Now you notice the spear in the bride's hand. Why does she hold a spear? It portrays having been passed through persecution. Swords and spears represent suffering and persecution. And if you recall when um, the old man in the temple um, was seeing Yeshua for his, um, for his circumcision 
and Anna and this, this also this old man, Zacharias, I think was his name. Um, they uttered prophecies over the infant Messiah. And um, one of the things that was said to Mary was a sword shall pierce your soul. That wasn't literal, but it was in reference to you will suffer. There's, there's suffering coming to you. Did that happen to Mary? Yes. Oh, great suffering. If you're the mother, there's nothing worse that could ever happen than for something bad to happen to your child. And um, so that is absolutely worse. You would much rather lay down your own life. So the concept of the spear in, in the hand of the bride. But notice that the spear is at rest. She has come through persecution, through great suffering, but it's over. And it's forever over. And so now is the time of joy. Notice her face is turned towards him and away from it. It's no longer a part of her experience. And also it's in her right hand. And that is the symbol that through him, she's leaning on him, she had strength to come through it. And so there's beautiful things in the pictures of this constellation. And this really is the constellation that is focused upon this month because the tabernacle of the sun is in Te'am this month. Um, another uh, scripture regarding this constellation is uh, Revelation 19, 7 to 9. Let us be glad and rejoice and give honor to him for the marriage of the lamb is come and his wife hath made herself ready. Blessed are they which are called unto the marriage supper of the lamb. These are the true sayings of Yah. So in other words, the Bible tells you, don't doubt it. The marriage of the lamb is coming. Don't doubt it. You are invited to be at the marriage. Also, don't wait around because you're called to get ready. Um, going through the stars very quickly, we have Castor and Pollux, as they're called today, up in the heads of the bridal couple. Um, these are not their original names. Uh, Pollux means ruler and judge. And uh, Rea in Hebrew is the name to have dominion and to reign. And so the wife will reign with her beloved. When he reigns, he said, if you suffer with me, then you will also share in my glory. And so the meaning is rulership and reigning. And then Castor, to exalt, uh, to shine. The Hebrew name is Or, meaning to be glorious. He will receive great glory. That's the star in the face or in the head of the bridegroom. And uh, down in the knee, we have um, the one who treads under his feet, Durak in Hebrew, to tread under. And we find that in Psalms 91, 13, that through his people, Yah will tread down the lion and the scorpion and the dragon and the adder and all defeat the power of hell. And then in her foot, we have the uh, star Alhenna, and it means to be afflicted and... Um, we, we know that that will also be part of her experience. Okay, so the primary message of the month of June, of course, is Te'am, the call to the marriage supper of the Lamb. Now, within that month, there are sky events. As I mentioned, one of them was last night. Um, we had a conjunction with Mars and the beehive cluster. Conjunction merely means that the two bodies are visually close together. So let's look at the players in this event. I already talked to you about an overview of what they all mean. Mars is ma'adim in Hebrew, and it means bloody or war. In the Maseroth, it is a symbol of warning of the onslaught of Satan against the saints in the last days. It warns of certain coming persecution and suffering. And it's usually in sky events before the persecution and suffering comes down. Just before. Revelation 12, 17 tells you where the war is coming from. And the dragon was wroth with the woman and went to make war with the remnant of her seed. That's the people living in the last days, which keep the commandments of God and have the testimony of Yeshua Messiah. Having the testimony of Yeshua Messiah is having the testimony that you believe Yeshua is Messiah and you're not falling into the prey of the Antichrist. Okay. So who is this war against? Those who keep the Torah and those who have the testimony that there is only one Messiah, and that is Yeshua HaMashiach. For them, there is a target on the back from the kingdom of hell. Okay? So 
Interestingly enough, um, Ma'adim, Mars, conjuncted uh, Presepi, in, which is the cluster, also known as the Beehive Cluster, M45, in the constellation today called the Crab. It's nothing to do with a crab. Anciently, this constellation is a sheepfold. In fact, this sheepfold represents the final millennium. The name of this constellation is Nava, and uh, Nava is um, representing the, the resting place, as in not dead, but Sabbath rest of the saints. And Presepi is this open star cluster, lots and lots of stars there, and this little star cluster known as Presepi, which means the innumerable seed. Now, you remember that Yah told Abraham that he would have seed that was so great you couldn't count them? Innumerable seed, like the stars of the heavens, like the sand of the sea. And so this picture, this star picture, is the very word Yah said to Abraham. Your seed will be like, in the modern word that they have used is presepi, but the Hebrew word that you find there in the verse is the original star name. It is the innumerable seed. You can't count them. There's that many. And so um, Yah promised Abraham that his seed, his descendants would be as uncountable, as innumerable as the stars. And of course, this is the meaning of this star cluster. So now notice that Mars, the one Ma'adim, bloody war, bloodshed, is at the innumerable seed. There's the conjunction. Can you see it there in the sheepfold? So in this sky event last night on Sabbath, Mars overlaid Nava and the, in Presepi. And that indicates that we are being called into the millennial rest. There is a great Sabbath coming. We will rest. But before we get to the rest, every one of us who are going to be part of that innumerable seed need to expect the blood. You have not yet resisted unto blood, striving against sin. And so Mars is telling us that we have a rite of passage that we have to pass through to get to that sheepfold. The rite of passage is that all who live godly will suffer persecution. Second Timothy 3.12, it will cost you something. It cost your heavenly king everything he had to give. And he's God, he has a lot to give. It cost him everything he had to give. His own life. Suffering is the rite of passage into the sheepfold. Suffering for God's people, but though I want to remind you, it's good. Because it says in Romans, all things work together for good to those who are called according to his good purpose. And the good is that Yah allows the suffering into our lives to try us, to burn off the dross. Gold tried in the fire. Suffering brings glory to Yahweh also. And there will be converts for the kingdom from the suffering of the saints. So Yah will bring good about, but he wants you to know you can't be the seed of Abraham without passing through the experience of Ma'adim. Okay? So that warning is clear in this sky event. Next, we have a full moon, um, which is coming about tomorrow evening, and that will be the last normal full moon of the whole summer. Beyond that full moon tomorrow, the rest of them are going to be supermoons. So we'll talk about supermoons in a minute. June 14, though, we're going to skip ahead to that one, is the fourth of five moon-Jupiter conjunctions. So anytime you have something repeated in Scripture, in the mouth of two or three witnesses, let everything be established. If you have a Bible prophecy and it's repeated multiple times, what do you know about that prophecy from the repetition? It is important or unimportant? Very important, underscore important. So the fact that this particular sky event is repeated five times in 2023 ought to tell us that it's very important. Heads up, notice this, pay attention. You might even count this as one of the theme sky messages for this year because of the fact that it is repeated so many times. So what are the players in this conjunction? Well, the first is the moon, of course. The moon is the bride of Christ. It is Lavana, clothed in white, those who are clothed in white. 
And so um, next we have Jupiter, as we call it today. Jupiter is Sadek, king of righteousness, uh, to reign in righteousness. And in Isaiah 41, 10, we have the message of Sadek, this planet. It is this, fear thou not, for I am with thee, Yah says to his people. Be not dismayed, for I am thy God. I will strengthen thee. Yea, I will help thee. Yea, I will uphold thee with the right hand, great strength, of my righteousness. Every time you see Jupiter as a player in the sky, Sadek, it is Isaiah 41.10, the promise of Isaiah 41.10. This is the message to Yahweh's people. To the wicked, it's a different message. To them, it's the message that I do reign in righteousness. I do see your wickedness and I will judge you for it. You do have a comeuppance coming uppance. <laughs> okay. So, but Isaiah 41.10 is the message of Sadek to the people of Yah. So notice where the placement is for this fourth of five uh, conjunctions. It's interesting. I'm going to show you where all four, five of them happen this year. The placement is very significant. Like, how do you tell time? By looking at the placement of the hands upon the face of the clock. The numbers on the clock don't move. Only the hands move. The planets are the hands. The, the numbers are the, like the constellations. They stay still and the planets move about upon them, helping us tell time helping us discern the signs. So on Wednesday, June 14 of 2023, we will have this conjunction. It happens in Tala, wrongly called Aries, which is a ram. Tala, the old way to portray this constellation, is the worthy lamb that was slain. Tala, of course, represents the Savior, but he's not slain here. He is the one who was slain, but now he is being glorified. The Bible says in Revelation, worthy is the lamb that was slain to receive power and riches, wisdom and strength, honor and glory and blessing at the moment when that glory is given to the lamb by everyone. The Bible says that every knee will bow of things in heaven, of things in earth and of things under the earth at the name of Yeshua HaMashiach. Worthy is the lamb that was slain. This constellation is ultimately fulfilled on the final day of atonement, the moment when every knee will bow. So the placement in this constellation highlights the message of Yeshua in his role as the worthy lamb that is slain. Tala, the savior in glory, in his moment of being glorified in the last days, which again happens on the final day of atonement when every knee bows at the name of Yeshua. So we have the king of righteousness representing Yah in righteousness and judgment and rulership and the moon, Levana, being joined with the king of righteousness so that he tells her in my strength, I will be with you in trouble and you will come through to share my glory. I think it's so cool that the second sky event is sharing in his glory when the first sky event was to share in his suffering, wasn't it? So he's always interspersing messages of comfort. And so this constellation reminds us to anticipate, share in his suffering now and prepare to one day share in his glory. What joy is coming. Okay, we will be having, of course, the new moon. It'll be the fourth new moon of uh, the year. And that will be on, uh, cited on June 19 and the new moon day on June 20. And then we have our summer to Kufa, which is the day when it's the longest day of the year and the shortest night on June 21. And to Kufa is the Hebrew word that is referring to the equinoxes and the solstices. If you're in the southern hemisphere, it'll be the shortest day of the year for you on June 21 because you're in winter. They have opposite seasons of us. Okay, now let's look at July. Sky events for July. And the art here, the pictures are from my calendar, if you're wondering where they came from. Since I already had the art from the calendar, it was just real easy to throw a mirror into the slideshow. <laughs> All right. So in July, again, we see the sun visually passing through the heavens. And um, where is it visually in July? Well, of course, it would be moving one constellation after the next. So it was just in Taom. The next one would be Nava. They call it Cancer today. Nava represents the habitation, 
the resting place, the dwelling place of the righteous. And the name for this constellation is found in many places in Scripture, but in Exodus 15, 13 is one of them, and we read, Thou in thy mercy hast led forth a people which thou hast redeemed. Thou hast guided them in thy strength unto thy holy habitation. The holy habitation is Nava. And so the millennial rest is the picture of having come through to the holy habitation. And when you come to that spot, there's no suffering forevermore for all eternity. I once heard a youth evangelist describe eternity. He said, if you had a little fly, little tiny gnat sized fly, and his little wings, you know, and you had this great big size of earth steel ball hanging there in the space somewhere, and this little tiny fly came by every thousand years, and then he just little tipped his wings on that steel ball and flew away, come back in a thousand years. How long would it take him to wear away the steel ball? And he said, however long it would take him to wear away the steel ball, eternity is just beginning. Doesn't that boggle the mind? So, <laughs> like I always used to tell my kids, guys, this isn't living. This is probation. Living is what you get to do next. And the next is Nava. Okay, now as I mentioned, after the June new moon, or, or full moon, excuse me, we have four supermoons in a row. Supermoons, what are supermoons? Well, first of all, let's start with the dates. We have July 3, August 1, and August 31. By the way, it's called a blue moon when a single month has two moons in it, two full moons. Biblically, you can never have a blue moon because every uh, month cycle is a moon biblically. But on our Gregorian calendar, because the Gregorian calendar is not aligned with the moon, you can sometimes have two full moons in a given month. And so the pagans call it the blue moon. If you're wondering where the term once in a blue moon comes, it doesn't happen very often that you have two full moons in a Gregorian month. You'll never have two full moons in a biblical month. I want to underscore that, okay? <laughs> Impossible, because a month biblically is from one new moon to the next, and you only have one full moon in there. So <clears throat> in the month of pagan month, Gregorian month of August, you have on the 1st and on the 31st full moons. And then your fourth of the super moons will be on September 29. So I'm going to talk about them all. Even though I'm still talking summer, I'm going to go ahead and go into September just for the super moon update. Well, at first, we want to begin with the players in this event. Lavana, the moon itself. Anytime you have something going on with the moon, guys, it is a direct message to the end time people of Yahweh because the moon represents the saved people of Yahweh, those who are clothed in white. The woman stands upon the moon. It is her foundation because it represents to fully reflect the loveliness and character of Yah. The moon reflects the light of the sun. And in addition, it is to be clothed in white. And it is her foundation calendar-wise. It is her foundation in terms of the law of Yahweh reflecting the character of God. There are so many applications to this. But uh, this woman on the moon is a symbol of the Bride of Christ. Now, the moon orbits around the earth, but not in a perfect circle anymore. And uh, it's elliptical. One side is closer to earth than the other. And as a result, the distance between the moon and the earth varies throughout the year. Okay? The point on the moon's orbit when it is closest to the earth is called the perigee. And the point when it's farthest away is called the apogee. And when a full moon takes place, when the moon is near its closest approach to Earth, it is called the supermoon. Okay? A micromoon, on the other hand, is when the, earth, uh, the moon is the farthest from the Earth around apogee or when it's farthest away. And so when the moon is closest to Earth and a supermoon occurs, it also is going to look 30% brighter than a micro full moon, 
and 16% brighter than an average full moon. And I'm just going to play a short little video clip here to demonstrate that for you. So we see a supermoon occurs when a full moon is at its closest distance to Earth. So we call that perigee. The perigee versus the apogee. And supermoons appear 14% larger and 30% brighter. And that is what makes a supermoon. So this summer, you can expect some very spectacular full moon displays. But part of the importance of these supermoons is their placement. So let's look at the placement. The location of the supermoon on July 3 is in Keshef, the horseman of Revelation 6, representing the giving of the final Elijah message, the giving of the final gospel message. Remember I mentioned that the arrow is the Elijah message? And so the, the white horse and rider goes through the earth offering the crown of life, salvation. Okay, and so the position of the full moon here, the super moon, will be near the back side of the horse to show we are in the last days. The time to give this message is now. The gospel must go forth to all the earth in power, and then shall the end come. Next, the second super moon will be on August the 1st, and that one is located in Gedi, the goat fish of atonement, also known as Capricorn today, and it's in the fish body which means it is time to have already experienced personally the atoning work of Yah in the dying goat and to have become living fish. When we are baptized and we put on Christ, then are we heirs according to the promise to represent the necessity of God's people of being baptized, being born of water. We are all represented as fish because fish are born of water. And so Yah said to his, his disciples, Follow me and I will make you fishers of men. And we get the word fisherman or fisherman from evangelist to be fishers of men. And so the, the message of the moon's position in the, in the fish tail of this constellation is to show it is time to be living fish. It is time to catch fish for the kingdom. It is time to be about your father's business. And when you are giving the Elijah message, the gospel going to the whole world with power, and when you are baptized and you put on Christ and you become living fish for his kingdom, and you are now catching fish for the other, for his, uh, for his glory, then you will experience the message of the next full moons, super moons of this summer. And they are all in the two fish called Dagim, Pisces today. These two fish represent Philadelphia and Smyrna. Philadelphia are the saints who are translated without seeing death. For Smyrna are the martyrs. And the band that ties their tails is connected to Cetus, the sea monster, representing both a dragon and a fish. Because the synagogue of Satan say they are Jews, they say they are fish, but they are not. Really, they are of their father's kingdom, who is who? Satan, the dragon. So the persecutor of these two true fish is the dragonfish, the synagogue of Satan. And the band represents suffering and persecution. The one group will be translated and taken to heaven without seeing death, having been supernaturally protected from death. It's not that the devil didn't try. The other group will be martyred. And so the super moon of August 31 is highlighting the martyred fish the one lying down in the heavens and seeing death. Smyrna. And interestingly enough, the fourth supermoon is also on that side in the band of persecution right about the coil. And it is September 29. And so the location of these four supermoons indicates giving the gospel message, it's time to do it. It indicates to be living fish for his kingdom. And when you are, be ready to lay down your life because you will be targeted by the kingdom of hell. You're a threat. You'll be targeted. But that's okay because Yah says, be faithful. He says to Smyrna, be faithful unto death and I will what? Give you a crown of life. No man can take it from you. He puts before you an open door, you and me.
Okay, the next event of the summer is the Delta Aquarids Meteor Shower. And this will be July 28 and 29. It is a Friday night and early Sabbath morning. So this will be a Sabbath sky event when it peaks. Now meteor showers always happen before and after the primary day. But the primary day is when you go out on that particular night, you will have the most meteors that you're ever going to see that year for that particular shower. I think it's very interesting that falling stars are a sign. We're going to talk about that. But considering that they are all signs of the end of the world, I have to tell you that every annual meteor shower that we see in our heavens, every single one of them began in the 1800s or later. They are all about the end of the world. We get used to them. They happen annually. And we, we tend to forget that they are signs that you are living in the last days. So the location of the Delta Aquarids meteor shower is the constellation Delhi. It radiates out from that. That's called its radiant. And of course, Delhi, uh, now called Aquarius, is the heavenly water man. And it represents the outpouring of the Holy Spirit, water. Water is the presence of the Holy Spirit, the latter rain, water. The picture represents the innermost being, which the Bible sometimes calls the bellies of Yahweh's people. And as it says in the Bible, that if you belong to Yah, out of the belly will flow rivers of living water, out of the innermost being will flow rivers of living water. That's what's being pictured here. And the fact that that water source is heaven is shown by the fact that, the, uh, that Delhi has his hand stretched up to heaven. Now, within this constellation, we have several deep space objects. One of them is the helix nebula that looks like the eye. And I've kind of blown it up there, made it a little bit bigger. The Helix Nebula is located in Delhi, and it is actually the radiant point of this, uh, of this star shower. It represents the Hebrew letter Ayin. Ayin for spiritual enlightenment, the eye, to be able to see and understand and live by wisdom. And the Helix Nebula is located in the, in the radiant point of the Delta Aquarids meteor shower. So it really is a call to be filled with the Holy Spirit, to have out of your belly flowing rivers of living water, which you will do if you are not blind, but instead can see. Ayin. And he says we can only see if we have spiritual discernment through his spirit. See the connection with the Holy Spirit? Everything about this constellation is about the Holy Spirit. Now, as a reminder, every time you see a meteor shower, it always means one thing. Falling stars are a sign that the second coming is getting very close. And Yahweh has been giving us these annual meteor showers since the 1800s, which if you're an eternal being, that's close. If you are a earthling <laughs> like we are, you would be saying, well, 1800s, I wasn't alive then. That was a long time ago. But in terms of eternity, when you're in the 1800s, you're very close to the second coming. Can you see it from that perspective? <laughs> so the warning is, hey, you're now living in the last days. And I would have to say that Yah marked the last days in terms of the big period at the, at, in the 1800s, marked by the heavenly event of the falling stars. Revelation 6.13 says, And the stars of the sky fell to the earth as the fig tree sheds its winter fruit when shaken by a gale. And that happens in Revelation 6 as a sign of the end. And Matthew 24, 29, immediately after the tribulation of those days, the sun will be darkened and the moon will not give its light and the stars will fall from heaven and the powers of the heavens will be shaken. Now, typically when we see a meteor shower, it's only a shower, not a storm. Um, the Leonid's meteor shower, which is the, in the Lion constellation, is the one that in 1833 fell at a rate of more than a thousand an hour. Now, if you have more than a thousand an hour, in fact, it was described as stars falling like rain. If you have that going on, they call it a storm. Okay. And so at any given year, it's possible for a meteor shower to become a storm. But um, they are especially significant. I think when we are looking at the final ones, we'll be looking at storms, not, not just showers. Okay, 
Here's the Exalted Waterman Delhi, the location. It has deacons, one of the deacons. Deacons are supporting constellations that are part of that primary constellation star family. One of them is the Great Fish, which is drinking up all the water flowing from the Waterman's pitcher. And that demonstrates that out of the belly's flowing river of living water, there will be converts for the kingdom. There will be fish. And then we have um, uh, Pegasus, the uh, winged horse representing judgment coming. Horses are the transport to the kingdom of heaven. Uh, the prophet Elijah, what was his transport? How was he taken to heaven? In a flying chariot, which is represented by the winged horses. And uh, so winged horses represent the, the coming of the king to take his people home. And so Delhi, the waterman, is bringing the outpouring of the Holy Spirit, bringing the light of truth to the planet, and the coming of Yah is very soon. Translation is coming. And then we have uh, the, another symbol of the Holy Spirit represented in the dove or the water bird. Um, and the name of this constellation is Ruach. Today it's called Cygnus, and it's also known as the Northern Cross because the constellation is cross-shaped. These are the deacons, okay? We're just going to focus on the primary, but the deacons are also part of it. Delhi is buckets, and the name of this uh, constellation and that meaning is found in Numbers 24, verse 7. He shall pour the water out of his buckets, Delhi, and his seed shall be in many waters, and his king shall be higher than Agag, and his kingdom shall be exalted. So Delhi, which is now called Aquarius, and Aquarius is Latin for the pourer forth of water, is a star picture that, as I mentioned, represents the outpouring of the Holy Spirit and the truth of the word represented as water, as the Bible represents truth in Isaiah 44, 3 and Ephesians 5, 26. We know that um, it says in John 7, 38, he that believeth on me, as the scripture has said, out of his belly shall flow rivers of living water. Without God, we are described as being dry and barren like a desert without water, Psalm 63, 1. But when we are spiritually alive and fully revived, we are represented as being flourishing by rivers, Psalms 1, 1 to 3. In Joel 2, 28 to 29, it tells us Yah promises to pour out his spirit upon all flesh, all people, bringing life to souls who are spiritually dry and dead. And this prophetic message is the promise of Delhi. Okay, and it says in John 4:14, 4, Whosoever drinketh of the water that I shall give him shall never thirst, but it shall be in him a well of water springing up unto everlasting life. There is a star up here in the head of the waterman. The Hebrew star name is Ara, meaning to pour out. There's a star here in the picture. In Arabic, it's Sa'ad al-Malik, and it means the record of the outpouring. In Hebrew, Shafak is the name, and it means to pour out the spirit symbolized in the water. That uh, is the word that's found in Joel 2, 28 and 29. Down here in the leg of the waterman and touching into the water, we have Shiat who goes and returns, meaning Christ is the one who went and promised to return. And so we recognize that this is a, a message of Messiah. And we see that the waterman pouring out his water does not do it in vain. For there is a great fish constellation being the deacon here. And this deacon shows many converts for the kingdom. In Jeremiah 16, 16, it says, Behold, I will send for many fishers, saith Yahweh, and they shall fish them, that's a good thing, catch them for the kingdom, for salvation. What do you fish for? Fish. Converts. Converts for the kingdom, those who are baptized and put on Christ, are represented as fish. Ecclesiastes 9.12, For man also knoweth not his time, as the fishes or dag, they are taken in an evil net. So are the sons of men snared in an evil time. So in this case, um, fish are representative in a negative way, showing the transience of man. But again, fish represent people. And in Psalms 2.8, we find an encouraging message that Yah tells his fishers of men. 
Ask of me, and I will give you the heathen for thine inheritance. Psalms 2.8. Matthew 4.19, he saith unto them, Follow me, and I will make you fishers of men. The brightest star in this deacon constellation is Fomal Hot, which means the mouth of the fish. And uh, it has to do with the taking in of the life-giving water. Okay, now let's look at this meteor shower now that we understand something about its meaning from the constellation it takes place from. Yahweh is calling his people in the Delta Aquarids meteor shower that takes place July 28 and 29. He's calling us to be among the people who are filled with his spirit and bear the living water to the dry and thirsty world. There is a famine described in Amos equated with a lack of water, which is caused by not hearing the word of Yahweh. So Yahweh's people are to be fountains of his word to the dry world. And this is the overall message of Delhi. But the Helix Nebula, which is the Ayin in the sky, reminds us that the eyes of Yahweh run to and fro throughout the whole earth to show himself strong in the behalf of those whose heart is perfect or wholehearted towards him. Second Chronicles 16, 9. So Yahweh's people are meant to stand out like in an oasis stands out in a desert. And Ayin is equated with wisdom, enlightenment, the ability to see. They that turn others to righteousness, pouring forth living water, will shine like the stars, Daniel 12, 5. But without a vision, the people perish. Yahweh wants us to get his vision, his goal. And this meteor shower highlights his goal. Catch the vision. Be spiritually insightful with his spirit. Be filled with his spirit and carry forth that gospel and that truth to a dry and thirsty land. August 13th, Perseid Meteor Shower. The Perseid Meteor Shower is one of the most popular and abundant showers of the year. It can produce up to 100 meteors per hour. This year, the Perseides peak is two days before the new moon, so observing conditions are favorable. This meteor shower is primarily visible from the northern hemisphere, where the radiant is always above the horizon. August 27, Saturn at Opposition Once a year, the Earth comes between Saturn and the Sun, so that the ringed planet is opposite of Sun in the sky, when the Sun sets in the west, Saturn rises in the east. At this time, the planet looks bigger and brighter than usual, so it's the best chance to observe it. Through binoculars, Saturn will appear as an oval-shaped disk, a telescope will reveal the rings. You will find it shining at a magnitude of 0.4, in the constellation Aquarius. August 31st, the biggest full moon of 2023. The supermoon occurring on August 31st, will come closer to Earth, than other full moons of the year. It will become the year's brightest, and most prominent full moon. Moreover, it is going to be a blue moon or the second full moon in a calendar month. October 14th, Ring of Fire, Annular Solar Eclipse. Another solar eclipse will be visible over the North and South American continents. Observers from these continents will see a ring of fire around the moon. The rest of the Western Hemisphere will experience a partial eclipse. The next solar eclipse of this kind will happen in a year and will be only visible from Chile and Argentina. That's an overview of what we can expect to be the most spectacular of the sky events of this summer and coming fall. With that, let's take a look at them in more depth. So August. August of 2023, what's going on in the sky in August? Well, of course, that is the month where we have two supermoons in the pagan month, the Gregorian month. The first will be August 1, and that will be a, su a supermoon. The um, featured constellation of August is the lion, Arie. In Jeremiah 4-7, we find that this uh, constellation is mentioned by name, and this particular constellation represents the judgment of Yah against the kingdom of hell, and it represents the day Satan is destroyed and there will never be, according to Nahum, any suffering or any, any affliction ever again for all the ceaseless ages of eternity. Isn't that good news? 
The lion has come up from his thicket, and the destroyer of the Gentiles is on his way. He has gone forth from his place to make his, thy land desolate, and thy cities shall be laid waste without an inhabitant. Gentiles, that is not a term that is used for the saved. When you are saved, you are Israel. The Gentiles will be destroyed. Okay, so will the kingdom of hell. So Arie, the lion that does that judging work. Now on August 3, we have a conjunction of the moon with Saturn. So let's take a look at that. Um, and in that conjunction, um, we are going to have a couple of important things, but I also want to talk to you about the meteor shower. Um, the Delta Aquarius meteor shower, as we mentioned, is located there in Delhi. And interestingly enough, that is the location of this conjunction between Saturn and the moon. So there's another emphasis on Delhi. Notice how close together these things are. So on August 3, uh, roughly after midnight, you'll find the closest approach of the two. Uh, the conjunction occurs in the belly of Delhi, the waterman. And that, again, that represents the outpouring of the spirit. And um, so... It says in John 7, 38, which is the message of this constellation, he that believeth on me, as the scripture hath said, out of his belly shall flow rivers of living water. And so we've got Saturn and the moon. What do they have to do with the belly and the rivers of living water? Well, let's see. First of all, remember who the moon is. The moon is the bride of Christ. Those who are clothed in white, having put on the righteousness of Christ. What is Saturn? Saturn in Hebrew is Sabbatai, or the Sabbath day. Saturn is the Sabbath day planet, and its message is the Elijah message, the final gospel message, the everlasting gospel. To show you that, let's look at Revelation 14, 6 and 7. We know that the gospel will go to the, of, the gospel of the kingdom will go to the whole earth and, as a witness, and then shall the end come. But another name for the gospel of the kingdom is the everlasting gospel. And in Revelation 14, it says what the everlasting gospel is. And I saw another angel fly in the midst of heaven, having the everlasting gospel to preach to them that dwell on the earth and to every nation and kindred and tongue and people. Pause. Christians, here's a quiz. You don't have to answer me, but think about it. If I ask you today, what is the everlasting gospel? What is the message that's supposed to go to the world? What would most Christians answer? The message of Yeshua HaMashiach crucified, right? Isn't that the gospel? Mm -hmm. Is that how the Bible defines the gospel? No, not that that isn't important. It's critically important, but that is not the gospel. The gospel of the kingdom, the everlasting gospel, is defined in Revelation chapter 14. Just told you that the angel gives this message. So you really do need to know what the gospel is. Here it is. Fear God, give glory to him for the hour of his judgment is come and worship him that made heaven and earth and the sea and the fountains of waters. The Bible says the everlasting gospel has four parts. Fear God, give glory to him. The hour of his judgment is come and worship him that made heaven and earth, the sea and the fountains of waters. That is the message of Sabbatai, Saturn. So let's look very carefully at it so that we can understand. What does it mean to fear God? Well, Deuteronomy 10, 12 to 13 says, what does Yahweh your God really want from you? Yahweh your Elohim wants you to fear him and do what he says. He wants you to love him and to serve him with your, all your heart, with all your soul. So obey the law of Yahweh. These laws and commands are for your good. What does it mean to fear God? Keep his commandments. Fear means to make afraid, yes, but deeper than that, it means to show reverence. For those who do not show reverence, they will certainly have wet your pants fear later. Well, I'm being honest. Okay? <laughs> fear Yah is to be in awe of, to show reverence for, and the fear of Yahweh is the beginning of wisdom. There are four things we will do if we really fear God. The first is we'll walk in his ways, meaning obey. The second is we'll love him. 
The third is we'll serve him with all of our heart and soul. And the fourth, according to Deuteronomy 10, 12 to 13, is that we will keep his commandments and statutes. So we do see that the message of fearing God is all about the Torah. In John 14, 15, it says, if you love me, keep my commandments. That's the love test. The second part of the everlasting gospel is to give glory to Yah. How do we do that? In Exodus 33, 18 and 19, it says, And Moses said, I beseech thee, show me thy glory. And Yahweh answered and said, I will make all my goodness pass before thee. And I will proclaim the name of God before thee and will be gracious unto whom I will be gracious and will show mercy on whom I will show mercy. God's glory is his character and his goodness. The angel with the everlasting gospel said to give glory to God. And another way to do that is to glorify Yah. How do we glorify him? Matthew 5, 16. Let your light so shine before men that they may see your good works and glorify your father, which is in heaven. How do we glorify him? We obey him with obedient works. He gets the glory. So guess what? There's Torah in part two as well. Also, it says the hour of his judgment is come in Revelation 14, 7. By what standard are we judged? Well, according to Romans 2, 12 to 13, we are judged by the standard of the Torah. In other words, dear ones, the everlasting gospel is all about the law of God and obeying him. To fear God means love him, serve him and keep his commandments. To give glory to him means do what Yeshua would do, act like Yeshua and glorify God, which means obey at all times. The judgment is the time to decide if we have kept Yah's commandments and statutes and if we have acted like Yeshua. And finally, worship him. Worship him as creator. It says in Exodus that... We are to worship him who made the heavens and the earth and the sea and the fountains of waters. Exodus 20, verse 8. Remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy. For in six days, Yah made the heavens and the earth, the sea and the fountains of waters. How do we worship him as it says to do in Revelation 14, 6 and 7? Keeping the Sabbath. Sabbatai the Sabbath day planet. Whenever you see Saturn in the sky in a sky event, think Revelation 14, 6 and 7, because that is what it means. It means fear God, give glory to him. The hour of his judgment is come. Worship him that made heaven and earth, the sea and the fountains of water. How do you worship the creator? Keep the Sabbath. Okay, with that in mind, on August 3, The conjunction of Saturn and the moon is a message that the bride must align with Sabbatai, the everlasting gospel. The bride will keep the Sabbath. She will be obedient to the Torah. The constellation in which the alignment visually appears is Delhi, the water carrier, connecting the alignment of the bride with Yah's Torah with receiving the Holy Spirit. Pentecost, the day of the outpouring. The first epic Pentecost, by the way, was at Mount Sinai when Yah spoke and gave the Torah. It already existed, but he refreshed it. And later the Holy Spirit was poured out on Pentecost in Acts 2. The outpouring of the Holy Spirit in the last days is connected with receiving the seal of Yahweh. Isaiah 8, 16, bind up the testimony, seal the law among my disciples. And so the message of this planet alignment with the moon In the belly is to say that if you would be those who out of the belly will flow rivers of living water, this is the water. Fear God, give glory to him. The hour of his judgment is come. Worship him that made heaven and earth, the sea and the fountains of water. This is the gospel message, the everlasting gospel. Revelation 14, 6 and 7. So Yah not only tells us to have living water, he tells you what the water is. Sabbatai. Revelation 14, 6 and 7. Then we have the conjunction of the moon with Jupiter, number 5 of 5 on August 8. Okay, so as I mentioned, there are five conjunctions of the moon with Jupiter and uh, this year. And this is the last of them. 
So five is very important, by the way. In the sky, numbers, intervals are also part of the message. Hebrew letters have numeric value. They double as numbers. So when you think of the number five, it will correlate with a Hebrew letter. And this sky message correlates with the message of the number five in Hebrew. We'll get to that in just a moment. First, let's look at this conjunction happening in Tala, the worthy lamb that was slain. And so once again, the message is to the bride who is represented in the moon. The king is coming. He is the king of righteousness. Be joined with him and we will be able to share in his glory at last. We'll look at the five in a moment. The fourth moon conjunction was also in Tala. So we have two moon Sadek conjunctions, Sadek being Jupiter, in Tala, the worthy lamb that was slain. And this one happens on June 14. Going back a little further in the year, let's look at the other three. They all happen in the same constellation. So all five conjunctions happen in two constellations. Two of them are in the lamb. The other three are in the two fish. The two fish representing the final time of Jacob's trouble. The persecution. Today, these fish are called Pisces. In Hebrew, they were known as Dagim. So on May 17, we had the second conjunction of the moon with Sadek or Jupiter. And this one happened in the band of persecution tied to the tail of the Philadelphia fish, those who are translated without seeing death. Yahweh is telling his people, you need to be joined with me in righteousness. I am your heavenly king. And through me, I will give you the empowerment, the ability to endure the persecution and be translated. Also, in the second and first moon conjunction with Jupiter, we have bands, the both sides of the band involved. On February 20. Uh, two, excuse me, February 22, um, we had the conjunction on the uh, Smyrna side um, where it was reminding of the um, death that many will be called to lay down their lives. And then um, the first part of the year, January 25, 2023, not the biblical year, but the Gregorian year, we have the persecution band on the other side, once again, being highlighted. And so there are five. Now let's look at the number for five. Five is hey. Hey in Hebrew is the letter for the breath, the spirit of God and his grace. And originally it was drawn in proto-Canaanite Hebrew as the man standing there with his arms raised, like he's saying, hey, <laughs> which is behold, and something important revealed, a sigh, a breath, and um, he is the first letter in the Hebrew word henna, which means behold in English. And it shows that something very important is to be seen. And it is fully appreciated through the Holy Spirit, the he, the breath of heaven. Le he appears in words like behold, the bridegroom cometh. Of course, that's the Greek version of it in Matthew 25, 6. And behold, the Lamb of God, which takes away the sin of the world in John 1, 29, again, translated from the Greek. But the message of the he is in these verses just the same. He signifies the window of the soul, the light and breath of heaven coming in. Psalms 150, verse 6, let everything that hath breath praise Yahweh, praise ye Yahweh. Psalms 18, verse 28, for thou wilt light my candle, Yahweh will enlighten my darkness. There are two hays in God's holy covenant name, Yahweh. And they show us that he breathed life into us at the beginning and will breathe eternal life into us. And, he, uh, and it also takes the presence of the Holy Spirit in us to truly praise Yahweh, which is shown by Hayes in the word hallelujah. Psalms 33, 6, Hay represents God's creative power. By the word of Yahweh were the heavens made and all the host of them by the hay of his mouth, his breath, his spirit. In the Hebrew Torah, the letter He appears strangely in the fifth word of Genesis 2, 4. 
In this verse, the hay appears smaller than usual. And there it is shown on the screen with the arrow pointing to it. The small hay draws attention to the fact that the heavens and earth were created by Yahweh's hay, the word of Yahweh who breathed forth creation. Also, Yahweh changed the names of his people by adding the hay to signify that they weren't just people anymore. Now they had the indwelling of his spirit and grace. Abram became Abraham by adding the hay. Sarai became Sarah by adding the hay. These are the generations of the heavens and of the earth when they were created in the day that God made the heavens and the earth. The hay is also the number of ingredients in the holy anointing oil, which is necessary for receiving the Holy Spirit. It's a symbol of that, isn't it? And take thou also unto thee principal spices. How many spices? How many ingredients? Five. One, pure myrrh. Two, sweet cinnamon. Three, sweet calamus. Four, cassia. And five, olive oil. And thou shalt make an, it an oil of holy ointment, an ointment compound after the art of the apothecary. It shall be a holy anointing oil. The holy anointing oil, significant of the Holy Spirit, was made up of five parts, representing the indwelling of the Holy Spirit. And the fact that after that oil has been applied to us, that we are set apart for holy use to be filled with the spirit of Yah, and we are not to be common anymore. The first ingredient is myrrh. Myrrh symbolizes suffering, trials, tribulations, and afflictions. The church of Smyrna is known as the suffering church. And that's why it makes sense when one realizes that the name for Smyrna comes from myrrh. <laughs> suffering and persecution are something that Yahweh experienced, Yeshua experienced. In fact, we are told that suffering was such an integral part of Yeshua's life. That it says in Hebrews 5, 8, although he was a son, he learned obedience from the things which he suffered. And just as he was given the gift of myrrh by the wise men, so we too, who are set apart for holy use and appointed as priests and kings, are to receive the gift of myrrh, suffering, from the hand of the master. It is not done to destroy us, but to teach us obedience. So the first part of the five Notice in the heavens, lots of pointing to myrrh. How many times has Smyrna been a part of the sky events? A lot. And now once again with the five, the Holy Spirit and the presence of the anointing oil. These things would have been commonly known to the biblical patriarchs. We have to go back to school to reclaim this knowledge. But, but guys, this is what he's talking about with this five-fold event in the sky. Anointing of the Holy Spirit. And you would immediately think anointing oil. Five ingredients. Five, the presence of the Spirit. Okay, cinnamon is the next ingredient. The cinnamon or sweet cinnamon denotes the savor to God that is pure and holy, not that of a natural sweetener as honey, but that of cinnamon, kunamon in Hebrew, to meaning to erect cinnamon bark as in upright roles. The sweet cinnamon speaks of the upright life, which we are enabled to live through the Holy Spirit's grace and indwelling power. Do we fall? Do we bow to wickedness? We stand straight and firm and erect, giving glory to Yah. Cinnamon, that's why that's in the anointing oil. Strength to stand firm, to be set apart in righteousness and not to bow the knee to Baal. Calamus is the next ingredient, the third of the five. In Hebrew, kana, it means a reed for measuring. The law of Yahweh is represented in this herb, in this ingredient, I mean. And there was given me a reed like unto a rod. The angel stood and said, rise and measure the temple of God and the altar and them that worship therein. Revelation 11, 1. The measuring rod by which we are measured or judged is the law of Yahweh, as it says in James 2, 12. Calamus is in the anointing oil to remind us to live in obedience to the holy law of Yahweh by his grace. Five, the message of the indwelling of the Holy Spirit in five. 
And there are five examples of the moon being united with Jupiter. Five. Sadek. Cassia. Cassia in Hebrew is kiddah, meaning shriveled rolls. And it's from the root word, which means to bend the body or neck in deference to bow down. This has to do with significant humility and reverence for the Most High. It's not bowing down to wickedness. For that, we stand straight and firm. But in worship, we worship Yah. Fearing Yah is the beginning of wisdom. And we are to be humble before Yahweh and pray. And our prayers are only acceptable when presented with a humble and contrite spirit. And the fifth, completing the message of five, the hay, is the olive oil. Olive oil represents the presence of the Holy Spirit in the life. And of course, it's the fifth and last ingredient in holy anointing oil. We are only able to be set apart for holy use, serving as Yahweh's priests, when we have the indwelling presence of the Spirit. Five, anointing oil, receiving the Spirit, being set apart for holy use. And it is also the window of blessing. Interestingly enough, the hay in modern Hebrew is formed by the dalet and the yod together. The dalet and the yod make the hay, the window of blessing, open to receiving the breath of air of heaven, the Holy Spirit. And so when you see the fifth conjunction of the moon with Jupiter, the whole message here is the hay. King of righteousness, the bride is to be clothed in white. She is to be set apart for holy use. She is to share in his sufferings, to be pure and true in in the time of most difficulty. And when she is, when she does by his grace, she will share in his glory. Okay, next we have the Perseids meteor shower, and that peaks the night of Sabbath, August 12. And this is an annual meteor shower. Uh, Perseus, as they call it, is not the actual name. The, the Hebrew name for this constellation is Paratz, but uh, it was later renamed. And the radiant point is coming out of the head of Perseus, or Paratz, and um, the head being the resh, representing the head uh, or authority of Yeshua HaMashiach, and he is the strong warrior being pictured here. And this, this uh, constellation would have been well known to David, when he went up against Goliath. And so we have the young, strong warrior having destroyed the wicked giant and having cut off its head. And what did David do to Goliath? He cut off his head after killing him. And so I know he must have been thinking of this constellation because there was no other reason to cut off his head, right? I mean, he was already dead. (laughs) But he was giving them a Parat's picture. I can just picture him there on the battlefield. Guys, holding up the head. I want you to think of the constellation. Because just as Yah has empowered us to take down this giant on earth, he will take down the whole kingdom of hell. And that was David's message that day. Beautiful message. And it is certainly true. Because the head of the giant here is Hasatan. Satan. The Satan is what Hasatan means. The Perseid meteor shower, as they call It radiates out from the head of Perseus or Peratz in Hebrew. And it's best viewed from midnight to sunrise. As you saw in the little video clip that I showed you, this is probably the favorite meteor shower of the year. It always has a lot of meteors. Um, Usually there's going to be 90 meteors per hour. So that's more than one meteor every minute in its peak. So, hey, take a nap, but you'll want to get up and see this one, even though it's going to be after midnight. Midnight and after is the best time. But it's a nice summer night, and so August 16 and um, is going to be the peak. Also, the moon uh, matters for seeing this meteor shower. If you have too bright of a moon, you won't see very many meteors. But this time, this year... This meteor shower's peak is going to be with a waning crescent moon, so the moon will not interfere. Um, You should expect uh, a good viewing time for this meteor shower. And this meteor shower is an annual reminder, 
an encouragement to the people of Yah. Our Messiah is coming and he is going to take Satan's head off. Isn't that good news? Weeping may endure for the night, but joy comes with the morning. And that mighty king is your king. And he can defeat Satan in you and in me and in our lives and in our sphere of influence and ultimately the planet and the universe. So we're very excited to see the message of Parats. And every year from the 1800s on, Yah has had an annual meteor shower, a celebration of the day Satan's head is taken off. There are deacons to this constellation. One of the deacons is Cetus, the um, dragonfish, also known as Leviathan. It is the synagogue of Satan in Revelation. It is the persecutor of the two fish, Philadelphia and Smyrna. That is one of the deacons of this um, constellation, um, at this star family. And it's to show that when he takes the head off Satan, that the synagogue of Satan is also going to go down. And another of the deacons, these are all deacons of the worthy lamb, Tala. Another of the deacons is the woman, Cassiopeia, as she's called today. And it represents the woman enthroned. She has been suffering, but she will share in his glory. And so she's holding a palm branch, a symbol of victory. She's sitting on a throne, the symbol of reigning with him. And um, Yahweh has these beautiful things to help us remember and be encouraged on the dark days. And here is the message of Parats. It's found in Micah 2, 12 to 13. And this scripture is pertaining directly to this constellation. And the name of this constellation is in this scripture. I will surely assemble, O Jacob, all of thee. I will surely gather the remnant of Israel. The remnant is the last day people of God. The breaker, Parats, is come up before them. And their king shall pass before them and Yah on the head of them. And so what a powerful message that Yah will break the power of the enemy. He will bring Satan's terrible reign to an end. And Yeshua HaMashiach is the one who is called Parats, the breaker. He is uh, called that in both scripture and in the sky. And so uh, Messiah is the one who is the mighty warrior, victoriously holding the severed head of the giant enemy just as young David once held up the head of Goliath. And in fact, the name of the star in the forehead of the severed head, Al Gol, Al -Gol. Gol. Goliath in Hebrew. <laughs> Isn't that amazing? And that's where David chose to kill the, the giant in the forehead, right there where that star was. The Goliath star is where he kills him. <laughs> and the guy has that name. I mean, seriously, I know he was thinking of this constellation. Anyway. It certainly was a shadow picture. And so the message is simple and encouraging. The devil will not always be able to hurt, ruin, and destroy. His time is short, Revelation 12, 12. Yeshua, who paid for our redemption with his blood, will one day put an end to Hasatan's tyrannical dominion. Good news in Parats. All right, that brings us to September 2023. And we don't have very many sky events. In fact, September's been fairly quiet this month, uh, this year, and last year, <clears throat> we do have the supermoon, uh, September 29. Of course, we also have the fall feasts. And we have, um, I should say, not all the fall feasts. We have trumpets and atonement. And we are going to be having a, um, uh, uh, the fall to Kufa or equinox. Uh, September is the month of Batula, the Virgin. And that's interesting because the Virgin is the first constellation in the heavens. September would be the seventh biblical month or the month when the seventh moon falls. And uh, interestingly enough, it is in the seventh month that sabbaticals and jubilees begin. So I think it's interesting that not only do sabbaticals and jubilees begin, but the whole Maseroth story begins in the seventh month. And so here we have the woman where the story begins, the Virgin Batula. <clears throat> and that's the constellation for September. Then we come to October, and this is the last month that we'll look at this month, uh, this today, I mean. So October of 2023, September might have been quiet, but October is not. 
October is the month when we have the Feast of Tabernacles right there at the beginning, October 1 through 8. And there's two meteor showers in October. There are a number of things. <clears throat> Before we get into them, the overview of October is that this is the month of the two scales, Mosanaeum. And it represents redemption's price and the warning of personal coming judgment. The message of the scales, and in fact, the name of this constellation is found in Daniel 5.27. Yah says, in fact, he said it to the king, Belshazzar, but he says it to every one of us. Thou art weighed in the balances and art found wanting. We are naturally found wanting. But if in Yeshua, we have the price of redemption paid. On our own, we are wanting. And to be wanting is to die. And that is exactly the outcome for Belshazzar when he received this message. To be weighed in the balances is to be judged. To be found wanting is to be worthy of death. And the Bible says, all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. And the wages of sin are death, is death. But the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ, Yeshua HaMashiach, our Adonai. Okay, so the first sky event of October is going to be on the 8th and 9th, which is the peak of the Draconids meteor shower, and it's going to fall. The peak is coming on the last great day. Uh, the Draconids meteor shower radiates out from the mouth of the dragon, Draco, and... Um, the, the mouth has to do with the speech, the doctrine, the laws, the enactments. We are warned in the last days to be braced against the lies and deceptions of the enemy. We are told that there will be wine from Babylon, which is false doctrine. We are warned that there will be unclean spirits like frogs coming out of the mouth of the dragon. Revelation 16, 13. We are warned that the serpent will cast out of his mouth Water as a flood to try to drown the woman, the true church, Revelation 12, 15 to 16. And in 1 Timothy 4, 1, we are warned, now the Spirit speaketh expressly that in the latter times, some shall depart from the faith, giving heed to seducing spirits and the doctrines of devils. Every time the Draconids meteor shower comes around annually, it is a warning. The things are coming out of the dragon's mouth. Do not be taken in. Be safe, be warned and be safe in Yah. Stand in the truth. Do not be taken out by the deceptions, by the uh, also dragon. The symbol of the dragon is Satan in his full persecutory power. Whereas when he's a serpent, he's more of a seductor. Persecutor, warning that if you don't obey his enactments, you may lose your life. You may lose your job. You may lose your family. You may lose your friends. It's going to cost you. And the cost is something that is the devil trying to drive you away from standing in the truth. So that is the warning and the message of this meteor shower. It is, respect it. This is the time of it. Watch out. Okay, then on October 14, we have the annular solar eclipse. Solar eclipses always go with lunar eclipses. <coughs> they are paired. And of course, in scripture, they are also paired. It says in the last days that the sun will be turned to darkness and the moon into blood before the great and terrible day of Yahweh come. The annular solar eclipse of October 14 will be on a seventh day Sabbath. And solar eclipses, as I mentioned from that scripture, always herald the end of the world. The location adds to the message. In this case, the annular solar eclipse is going to be in Spica, in the first fruits grain that is held in Batula the Virgin's hand. And the first fruits grain represents Messiah. He's the first fruits of them that died. It also represents the 144,000, the first fruits in the last days. Interestingly enough, this particular sky event, the annular solar eclipse, is joined by two planets, Mercury and Mars. And I'll talk about that in just a moment. But you can see Mercury sitting on top of the eclipse, and you can see Mars kind of hanging down below. All of them are in an interesting alignment in Betula. Now, um, 
This is this annular eclipse. It, annular means ring, ring of fire. And it's called an annular eclipse because the moon does not completely cover out the sun. It leaves a ring of fire. And it's going to be visible in the United States, in Mexico, in South and Central America. And to Yahweh's people, it is a call to prepare to be among the 144,000. The message is also echoed and deepened with the two planets in this particular sky event. Um, one of the things I want to point out is there's an interesting crossover in the path of the uh, full eclipse or the greatest magnitude of the eclipse from October 14, 2023. And there will be another eclipse, only that time it'll be a total solar eclipse in the spring, April 8 of 2024. Both of these eclipses pass over the United States. I'm kind of excited that the October 14, 2023 eclipse passes right over Roseburg, Oregon. Did you notice? We don't have to go anywhere to see this one, guys. Just go outside because it's going to be right over where we live. That's going to be cool, huh? So mark your calendars. But it isn't just Oregon. You'll notice it goes all the way down, making that arc coming down into Texas. And notice that in 2024, when we have the solar eclipse that's going to pass over the eastern and, and Midwest a little bit, uh, states of the United States, notice it also crosses into Texas. And there is a crossover point between the two eclipses. There is a part on the United States map where there are going to be people who get to see both by just walking outside. Did you notice that cross intersection? Where is that? Let's pull in a little closer to that. There are a couple of towns that are in the path to cite both eclipses, one being the annular eclipse pictured on the top and the other being the total eclipse, which is pictured on the bottom. That's when the sun really does go dark, okay? And towns like San Antonio and Uvalde, Texas are going to see both eclipses from just the yard, okay? So interesting. I've often wondered if there's not some major heavenly sign to regions that get a double whammy like that. And I think if you live in that region, that might be a prayer matter. Okay? I'm just going to leave it at that. That's between you and Yah. But I can't, um, I can't not note <laughs> that this is a double sign on these areas. And uh, always when there's a sky sign and it's visible in a certain part of the world, that certain part of the world is especially to pay attention. <clears throat> okay, so what is up with this annular uh, solar eclipse? And this will be the last sky event that we talk about today. Um, October 14, a seventh day Sabbath, the players in the event are the sun, comma, which signifies the heavenly father, the source of light and heat, the source of truth. The moon, the Lavana, the bride of Christ, who is clothed in white, she is the virgin. And the two come together to show that the sun and the moon, the moon is to be joined with the sun. The moon is to be fully in, in union with our heavenly father in full alignment. And so solar eclipses show us that full union and alignment with <clears throat> Then we have on top of the solar eclipse, and it will be probably dark enough to see it, we have Mercury, Coca. Coca in Hebrew is the name for Mercury. Coca is star in Hebrew, and it means the bright and shining star. The, the message of Coca is Revelation 12, 3. And they that be wise shall shine as the brightness of the firmament, and they that turn many to righteousness as the stars forever and ever. Are the 144,000, the first fruits, are they going to shine as the stars? Yes. Are they going to turn others to righteousness? Are they, going to, um, are they going to be wise? Yes, glory to Yah, they will. And so the calling is, you're to be joined with me, Yah is saying to his people, and you are to be the shining star. The coca, the message of coca is to be your testimony by his grace. And Mars is a little bit lower and separated from, but still in the same star constellation visually. 
Mars Ma'adim indicates war. Specifically, the placement is war against the saints. So when you join with Yahweh, when you choose to be wise and shine as the stars and turn others to righteousness by his indwelling presence, you can expect the war of the dragon is coming for you. And so that is what the Mars uh, means, the, the presence of Mars in this. The dragon is wroth with a woman and went to make war with the remnant of her seed. And this prophecy is soon to be fulfilled. By joining with Yahweh, though, we will be kept warm when the world is cold and dark. We will be filled with heavenly light, which are signs of spiritual life and truth during the war of the dragon. The first fruits grain is the 144,000, the bride. And the fact that the sky message in event happens in Batula indicates it's a special message to the bride. And dear ones, it's saying that the 144,000 is being made up. And we are all called to be among them. And that is the end of the sky events for, for all the way through October of 2023. The heavens do declare the glory of Yah. May we heed his messages. And let's pause for prayer. Gracious Heavenly Father, we see mighty things that you are at work doing. We recognize the times from the things that are going on in the world around us. And it makes your sky speech, which is always so timely, perhaps even more so. I pray that we will heed your messages in your word of your written word, as well as your sky word, and that we will be ready, that we will be filled with your Holy Spirit, that we will be obedient to you and faithful. Help us, Father, to that end. In Yeshua's name we ask it. Amen.